Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, the NumPy stack in Python. In this lecture, we are going to move on to another major task in supervised machine learning known as regression. I think classification is always a nice place to start because it's logically intuitive. Here is an image, tell me what it is. Here is an email, tell me if it's spam or not spam. Here are some measurements from a medical test. Tell me whether or not this person has some disease. It just makes sense. Regression is also very intuitive, but it's intuitive in a visual way. Let me explain. Here are some dots on the xy plane. Now it should be pretty clear to you that these dots form a pattern. In fact, you can draw a line straight through these dots, and you probably even pictured this line in your head, even though there wasn't one there to begin with. Here is another example. This one is not a line, but remarkably, we can still probably imagine what kind of curve would go through these points. So that's all there is to regression. Here are some dots. Now tell me the line or the curve that goes through these dots. So how is regression different from classification? Here is the big difference. Classification means you're predicting a category. Regression means you're predicting a number. This number is usually a number on the real line. So with classification, I'm trying to predict things that have no numerical meaning. If I see an email, I want to know whether it's spam or not spam. But you might object here and say, well, in the code, spam was 1 and not spam was 0. But in actuality, that doesn't matter. These numbers are just symbols to represent the actual category. We could just as easily make spam 0 and not spam 1. The results would be the same. In regression, the numbers actually do have meaning. In the next few examples, we'll see how this is the case. Here is a simple one. Given a person's height, I would like to predict their weight, or vice versa. Naturally, a taller person has more mass and therefore weighs more. This correlation isn't perfect, but generally it's true. You can imagine, let's say, that a dinosaur weighs much more than an ant. So how would a prediction problem work in this case? Well, see here we have a bunch of dots, but let's suppose we pick a height that nobody has. So I think around 195. Nobody in this data set weighs 195. But if I fit a line here, I can connect the height to that line and then look for the corresponding weight, and that would be my prediction. Another common application of regression is predicting house prices. If you're in real estate or you're in the business of buying and selling property, this is going to be very relevant for you. Note that in the pictures we looked at before, we were looking at 2D plots because those are things we can visualize. But just like with classification, we can have more than one input. For example, the price of a house may correlate with the average family income in the neighborhood and also the crime rate in that neighborhood. It might also depend on attributes like size, how many bedrooms it has, and when it was last renovated. Note that when you're dealing in higher dimensions, the thing you're predicting is no longer a line. If you have two inputs and one output, then you have three dimensions in total, so you're looking at a plane or if it's curved, a surface. If you have more than two inputs, then you have a hyperplane or a hypersurface. Of course, human eyes and human minds don't generally have the capability to visualize such objects. Let me just give you one more example here, since for both regression and classification, I want to give you a real business example where people can take these ideas and make lots of money from them. So we've all heard of the stock market. Generally, one of the rules for playing the stock market is that you should buy low and sell high. That way, you always get more money than you put in. Of course, things don't always work out this way, and many people let their emotions and fear get the best of them, but that's a story for another course. From a machine learning perspective, what would we like to do? Well, this is pretty simple. We would like to take some inputs, let's say the price for a stock for the past 10 days, whether or not the company had a news article written about it yesterday, and whether or not the news was positive. 
we can take those inputs and output a prediction for the price of the stock tomorrow. Of course, if you can do this accurately, you can become very rich. Let's again look at some code so you have a good idea of what it's going to look like in the following exercise. And just like before, we're going to start with what does the data look like? And just like before, we have two items, x, which is our input data, and y, which is our corresponding targets. Crucially, note that their shapes are the same as in the classification case. x is a 2D array of shape n by d, and y is a 1D array of length n. n is the number of samples, and d is the number of input features. So here's another example to help you visualize what's going on. Suppose I'd like to predict your grade out of 100, given some attributes of you as a student. So for example, how many hours you studied for the exam, how many hours you spent playing video games during the exam period, and how many classes you missed this semester. So this table you see here contains all this information. As usual, when we represent this in code, these are just arrays of numbers. The arrays don't know what those numbers represent, that's purely conceptual. And remember that these training samples help me make predictions in the future. So if you give me a new student and you tell me that they studied 15 hours and played zero hours of video games and missed zero classes, I would be able to predict their grade using my model. All right, so what does the actual code look like? Lucky for us, it actually looks exactly the same as before. First, we instantiate the model, let's say we're using linear regression. Then we train the model by calling fit and passing in x and y. We can also make new predictions by calling the predict function. Finally, we can evaluate the model by calling the score function. One minor difference here is that the score function no longer returns the accuracy, which only makes sense when we're doing classification. Remember that accuracy is just the number correct divided by the number total. That makes sense when we have labels, because if you guess the right label, then you're correct, otherwise you're not. But for regression, that doesn't really make sense. Suppose the price of a house is $1 million, and we predict $1 million and $1. Does that mean we're wrong? No, in fact, intuitively, we know that this prediction is pretty good. But what if the price of the house is $1 million and we predict $2 million? Intuitively, we can tell that this prediction is pretty bad. So in general, one way to measure the performance of a regression model is to use the mean squared error. That means I take the square difference of every prediction and its corresponding target, and then I take the average of all those square differences. There are reasons we use the squared error over other different kinds of measures, but that's a topic for a later course. Importantly, the mean squared error is not what is returned by the score function. Let's think about why we might not want to use the score function to return the mean squared error. Think about house prices. These are numbers that are going to range from a few hundred thousand to millions. Now think about grades. These are numbers that are going to range from 0 to 100. So in this case, magnitude matters. As discussed earlier, you don't really care if a house costs $1 million and you guess $1 million plus 100. But if you're predicting grades, then the difference of 100 in the prediction is huge, as that's as large as the entire range of possible values. What we care about is the relative difference between the squared error and the possible range of values. So here's what we use instead, which directly takes this relationship into account. What the score function actually gives back is called the r-squared, which is the correlation coefficient squared. In practice, a simple way to calculate it is 1 minus SSE divided by SST. SSE stands for sum of squared errors. This is just like the mean squared error, except we take the sum instead of the mean, so we don't divide by n. So for each prediction, we take the difference between it and its corresponding target, square the difference, and add all those square differences together. SST stands for sum of squares total. This is the sum of square differences between each target 
and the sample mean of the targets. Now, why does this make sense, you may ask? Well, if you notice, this is actually proportional to the variance of the targets. So if I divide SST by N, I would just get the sample variance. And why is that important? Well, it tells us something about the range of values that the target can take, which is what we wanted. Let's analyze this formula a little bit. What happens if my model is perfect? Well, then my predictions will be equal to the targets, and so the squared error will be zero, and hence the R squared will be one. So a perfect model gives me an R squared of one. What happens if I just have the dumbest model possible? Suppose I don't even bother using the inputs, I just predict the average target every time. Well, then my mean squared error is equal to the variance, and so I get 1 minus 1 equals 0. So an R squared of 0 means I'm using the dumbest model possible. Note that it's also possible for the R squared to be negative. If my predictions are so wildly incorrect that the difference between the predictions and the targets is bigger than the difference between the targets and their mean, then the numerator of this ratio will be larger than the denominator and you'll get 1 minus a number bigger than 1. Now I just want to make a short note here that it is not my intent to go too deep into the meaning of the R squared in this course. We're going to do that in a later course, so please don't worry too much about it now. What's important is that you just understand what comes out of the score function. All you really need to remember for now is this. To summarize, 1 is the maximum value you can get for the R squared, and that means our predictions are perfect. 0 means our model is no better than doing the dumbest thing possible, which is just predicting the average value of the targets. A negative number means we do even worse than the dumbest thing possible, so hopefully you never get a negative R squared.